as robbers, you only get one opportunity to get it right because you know the flying squad have had to shoot to kill policy for a number of years. So our biggest fear of going in on any job is not the fact that we're doing it, it's the fact that when we come out, they're going to shoot us in the chest. I grew up in Camden Town. Um, my early childhood was uh, was one of it's quite eventful. You know, I, I, I didn't like living in in, uh, in poverty, and we come from a quite impoverished uh, area. And if you wanted anything, you had to go and get it, especially being uh, having a mum who's a single parent. I can remember a time where we used to have the trains used to come through, and uh, me and my pals we used to jump on the trains, take them black bags of us and uh, just take all the radios out and we would get off three or four miles down the track. And uh, that was really my, my early years. What was your experience of school like? Um, I got expelled uh, when I was about eight or nine years old. Um, I uh, had a fight with a kid and stabbed him with a pencil case and I got kicked out of school. Um, I then got put into a kid's home and um, about 10 years old. You know, you know, I can always remember going to uh, being taken to the home for the first day, and um, I was with my social worker and, uh, and my mum, and uh, she said, "You've got to stay here till for a for a little while, for a couple of weeks." And I said, "Why?" You know, she said, "You have to." And then uh, they left, and uh, and I I've, 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 I didn't know what was going on. I was only young, and uh, next thing this this guy just whacked me straight in the face, bam. You know, the next thing they was all on me and said, you're not going anywhere. You know, you're going to be here for a long time. And that's what, that for me is when it really just all started my, my hatred towards authority against the establishment. And I didn't want to be, I, I, I just didn't want to be like, like them. And uh, they thought that they could beat me into submission. And when they couldn't, they moved me to another, another, another home and in another home. Uh, they, they put me in a, in a, in a flat. I was one of the youngest kids to, to sign on and, and have a flat. They put me in with a, with a couple of older guys um, that were sharing the flat. I was living in Hampstead, um, Belsize Park, Primrose Hill. I was surrounded by wealth. And after a, a couple of months of, of being there, I was then introduced to, to robbing post offices, building societies and, and other things. And did you ever get caught or arrested? Yeah, and, you know, when I was younger, I, I got nicked. I got nicked for a few armed robberies when I was a kid. Um, I done I done four years in a youth offenders uh, prison in Aylesbury. Uh, all you was a piss pot uh, and a jug of water in your cell. No television, no radio, and at times not even a book. And I think that was uh, I just got four years, then that was that was uh, definitely a. Uh, not conducive to me actually changing or rehabilitating me. In fact, it made me more of a hardened criminal. I, 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 I worked outside the country for a number of years. I worked in, as, a, as a young guy. I worked, I worked in Spain and uh, I sort of done my apprenticeship there where I was running, running puff up from, from uh, Marbella up to Valencia. I'd done that for a few years and um, you know, that, that was one of those things that, that taught me how to get in control of myself because, you know, we, had, they, we was going through roadblocks, uh, so you had, to, you had to keep really cool. Um, normally there'd be three of us, I'd be driving all the, all the gear up there, I'd have a front driver that would phone me if anything was going wrong, and then I'd, I'd have a guy behind me a couple of clicks back and he would have British number plates. Uh, so if it looked like there was going to be a rolling roadblock, he, he, I would just phone him or my other guy would phone him and tell him there's a roadblock, he would come up and normally nine out of 10 times, the police would, would, would follow him and, and we would just slip through. Because for us, it wasn't, a, it wasn't about guns and violence. For us, it was just about using our intellect, so, which meant no guns, just uh, uh, or no incontrusive violence. Um, you know, as I grew up, I wanted to take the art of robbery to the next level, um, which meant for me, uh, organising a team of like-minded guys. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to work with a team of guys that uh, could work under extreme conditions. Men with uh, tenacity to overcome their darkest fears of fight or flight, which is a very rare commodity within the British criminal underworld. In 2007, I was contacted by uh, an underworld uh, uh, guy who, who fixes jobs, 
he, he approached us on behalf of a, a banking uh, syndicate um, who wanted us to take over the Verizon building in, in Kings Cross, Camden Verizon holds uh, banking data for, uh, for JP Morgan and some of the leading banks in, uh, in America and England. And we came together to pull off uh, what the papers describe as the, the Ocean's Eleven heist. Um, where we, where we, uh, where we nicked five million pounds worth of uh, penny and chips and uh, 100 million pounds of a data. They wanted us to go in there and, and first of all, they wanted us to take a specialist with us. They wanted us to get him in there so he could download all the, the data from, uh, from, uh, from the drives. The data center uh, had eight levels of security, or eight layers of security, uh, which consisted of um, a perimeter, uh, a 24-hour rolling patrols, a biometric uh, entry system going into the building. When you go past the main entry system, you come into a thermostatic pressurized compartment, which is about 13 foot long by about eight foot wide. And once you're in that compartment, the door shuts behind you, it pressurizes and the other door opens. You can't open both of them at the same time. Once through there, once you get accepted through that door, you then come into another turnstile, into a foyer with a bulletproof glass with a uniform guard behind it. He then buzzes you through to another turnstile where you go in. And then beyond that is, a, is another door uh, with a CTT camera operate, uh, operator suite uh, with three uh, security operators in there and beside them are, are panic buttons. But the most important bit of information that we received is that on the drive room and the, and the, the motherboard's room, uh, there was a private security uh, company monitoring them. So we had all that security to overcome and we also had the private uh, security company wanting them to overcome. At first I, I thought, you know, when I told my guys, they said, uh, you know what, tell, this, you know, this is impossible. We looked at all the schematics of it and we went through it, you know, we went through it and through it and through it and, you know, we realised that we couldn't go in there with guns. Uh, we realised we couldn't ram the doors because they were metal doors and they opened that. And plus, plus there was three uh, police stations within a mile vicinity. And there was one way in and one way out and um, as it backed onto a canal. So looking at it, it just seemed impossible. But I, you know, I didn't wake up every morning and ask myself, am I motivated enough to do what I do? You know, I, I didn't care whether, whether the jobs were easy or whether they were hard. I didn't care whether I wanted to do them or I didn't. You know, it was just a job to me. I spent, I spent three weeks looking at it. We parked across the road and all different, different places and we just looked at it for three weeks looking at who worked there, who's going in there, how many security guards were there, what were the times of their shifts, how many, how many uh, patrols that they had passed there with police. When you're a security guard, you've got a clock on all around the building. Now, that takes about an hour of all the security guards, so they all have to do it. If that doesn't coincide uh, with the right timing, then the, the alarms go off and, and, they've, and the, the, the old bill are sent there automatically. So we knew we only had one hour, that's why we gave ourselves one hour. We hired out a warehouse, we had the schematics, so what we did for the, for the while we was looking at it, we, 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 we taped out all the corridors and where it was, so we, we kept timing it. And, and after three weeks, um, we, had, we sat down and we had another meeting with the fixer and it, it, you know, it just became apparent that this, this was, was one job that, that this was impossible. And I was driving over to West Hampstead and um, there was, a, uh, there was all the cars were backed up and everyone was looking up and there was a guy on the, sh on the roof. And uh, I wound down my window and there was a cop where I said, what's, what's going on? He said, there's a guy on the roof threatening to commit suicide. I got a little thing in my head that I think I may be able to do. So I went back and told the guys and um, we came up with a different plan. So our plan was, we couldn't ram it. We couldn't do anything that was gonna draw attention to ourselves. So really we had to basically go as, as, uh, as the enemy and the enemy to us is the old bill. So we, we, had, um, we, we, we went and got an old uh, police van, cars, um, we got the whole uniform, all the comms, handcuffs, everything. The whole thing was about authenticity, about looking the part. We had IDs and everything else. But to make it really, really uh, stand out, we took uh, an Alsatian with us. So it was a canine unit. So when we pulled up, we would look, look the part. We hired uh, four technicians. So on the day of the robbery, I can, I, I can always remember, we, we met at the slaughter, we checked all our gear, we checked uh, 
you know, make sure the handcuffs, the radio's working, make sure all the bands are working, the cars. So I was in the front van uh, with, with my guy and one of my guys in the back with a dog. Behind that was, was my other two guys in the police car and behind them was four technicians and then the, the specialist guy that we took to download everything who we didn't really know, he was part of the, the banking syndicates person. Uh, he was behind them. As we got down there, we radio through for the, for, the, for the specialists to pull over and then all through for the technicians to pull across the road because our job was to take over the building and call them in. Um, and as we were just about to pull over, a, a siren went off behind us. It was a real old bill. And uh, so we, we pulled ahead. All I could hear on the mic was, what's going on, what's going on? I said, just calm down, everything's sweet. We let, we're going to let him pull past and see what he does. There was only one old bill in there. So, you know, it, we could easily have took him out. Um, but he, he came past, the sirens were on, and then the next thing he pulled forward. But we had overshot the mark to going in there. So we said, everyone just stay where you are. We're going to drive around the block, so we had to drive around again. I think it took us about three and a half minutes, four minutes. But we, we allowed ourselves 50 minutes, but now we'd lost four minutes. So by this time, all our adrenaline was flowing. When you are doing something like that, what's running through your mind? Because like, what would have been the risk of being caught I think, I've, I've, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, the decisions that we make are not taken lightly. You know, we always, we always knew the consequences were, were either a lifetime in prison or, or a death sentence. Um, because as, as, as robbers, you only get one opportunity to get it right because, you know, the flying, the flying squad have had a shoot to kill policy for a number of years. So our biggest fear of going in on any job is not the fact that we're doing it, it's the fact that when we come out, they're going to shoot us in the chest. So that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. I rang the, rang the bell, in the, uh, the main security came down. We said we've had uh, reports of someone on the roof. Um, we're a fast response robbery squad and we need to get access to the building. There's a little bit of hesitation and I said, open the f door, we, we need to get in. And the next thing they buzzed, they buzzed us in. They buzzed us through the, uh, the thermostatic pressure room and then they put us into the foyer. So, so we, we, we got through the first, the first part of it <coughs> and then we was in the foyer the night to explain to them uh, what was going on about someone on the roof. Uh, and, uh, and then they busted through the next turnstiles and in the CCT suite, this was our biggest problem because they all had panic buttons. So what I did, I, I took the head of security aside and said, listen, have any of your guys been up on the roof? And they said, no, nah, none of us have. I said, what? He said, why? He said, uh, I said, because we had information that the person climbing up onto the roof was dressed as a security guard. So I said, for my protection and my officer's protection, I'm going to have to cuff everybody in here. And that includes all your CT camera guys. So I said, stand up. And they all stood up and we cuffed them. We took them out into the, into the stairwell and uh, brought the dog through. And uh, we looked on the CCT cameras and we could see where all the other security guards were. Um, so we, we, uh, we just asked them to come down. We got one of the guys to call them all one down at a time. And as they came out of the lift or down the stairs, we just cuffed them and then put them in the stairwell. We then, we, we, we then ran up a few technicians and then um, a few cleaners and we cuffed them up. And then we left them with, with a dog handler and we just reassured them that, you know, look, everything's going to be fine, but we need to make a sweep of the, of the whole, whole uh, building. We then went to the, the mainframe computer room, uh, which was a, 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 a floor down below, which, which had all the, the circuit breakers for all the cameras on the, on the, on the level upstairs. And we took that out, I got on reception, pulled it, and then two seconds later the phone went off. It was a private security company. Uh, they said, listen, what's, what's going on? All our cameras have gone down. <coughs> what's the problem? And we just said, like, we've had a, we've had a, a surge in the mainframe computer system. Um, our tech guys on it now should be up and running between you know, 30 and 45 minutes. Uh, give us a ring back then and we'll, we'll update you. And he went, boom. For me, that was the only part of the job that we couldn't, we couldn't plan for because we didn't know whether we needed a code to give them a coded number or a coded message. Um, but thank God, uh, you know, just, just, it just sufficed enough that, uh, that it was just, uh, we, we gave an explanation and he, and he, and he took it and uh, he went about his, uh, his job. I then, I then radioed for the, for the guys to come across, the technicians and the specialists, and then my other pal took them upstairs to the room. They proceeded to, to, to download and take out all the motherboards. About 20 minutes into the job, um, a car pulled up and we thought it may have been like um, at the old bill, but, um, but it was two technicians, they came to the door, we buzzed them in uh, and I just said to my guy in reception, just let them go through and if they come to our floor, we cuff them up. If not, we just let them go and do what they've got to do. 
Um, and, they, and, and before I knew, they, they come up in a list and it went past my floor. And uh, they went about the business. I told my guy in the reception to keep, keep an eye on him. And he did that. I never told all my guys that all were there. I was I wanted them to keep moving. I didn't want them to stop. As I'm looking on the cameras, all I can see was, was two bags coming out at a time because we had built big laundry bags. So laundry bags were coming out two at a time so I could have some idea of how quick they were going. And, and every now and then I say that we need to move a little bit quicker uh, because we, we, we've now got about 35 minutes. Um, and, it, and, and the next thing I know it was two, two, two. And uh, you know, the, you, you know I, could, I, could, I could feel the anxiety and tension you know, building up you know, because we were, we were now in there for like you know, 50 minutes but we still had another 10 minutes to spare. Uh, and, then, and then eventually I, I said, all right, that's it. Are, are they all out? Cause we, had, we had to get a, a certain number of, uh, of motherboards. I think mean, it was 120 of them. We needed all them because the information that we, we were taking was also part of that. We wanted to get rid of everything so they couldn't, they couldn't access it and, and, and uh, find out what we'd taken. And about, two, you know, about three minutes to 10, I called it. We came and everyone came down with two bags. We all took two bags each. We left the, all the security guards and everybody cuffed on the stairs. And we, we, told, we told them we'd be back in a minute. First of all, the tech guys went out, put their bags in. Uh, then the, the specialist went across the road and, and he disappeared. He'd already he took his laptop and the bits and pieces that he had and, and he was on his, on his way. Um, we then took all that stuff and, and put it on the van. And then uh, we pulled away. And uh, we, we drove up Royal College Street. And as we came level with uh, Kentish Town Police Station, uh, all hell broke loose. All, all police cars uh, come across us, about six or seven old Bill vans. Um, thank God for us. You know, I can always remember my mate in the back again screaming, what the f is going on? You know, and the dog, I could hear the dog barking and everything else. And I said, just, just calm down, man. It's just, you know, it's just a normal reaction. It was now six minutes past 10, and apparently the old Bill had, had, had uh, gained entry to, to it. Uh, and they'd surrounded the whole building, but we was, we was level at Holmes Road. And all of a sudden they, they pulled past us and I just looked at my, my pal and we was just like, a little grin, and like, we, we cracked it, we're gonna get through this. And as we drove up to the, to the Kentish Town station, uh, the train station, there's another entrance and the next thing on is there's about 10, 15 police cars come flying out. And uh, I remember the t two of the old Bill walking past and, and I looked over and they, and I went, and they went right to us. And then we just drove on. You know, so we drove, we drove up Kentish Town. We then drove up to the slaughter. I'm not going to say where it was because uh, they never ever found it. Um, we drove about 40 minutes and we went and parked it, all our gear in the slaughter. We then gave the cars and everything to someone to get rid of. Uh, we went back and changed all our gear and got rid of it. And then we went out. We went out uh, and a little celebration drink. I was tasked then with, uh, with my other pal to take uh, the, all the motherboards down to a Kenwood House over in Amstead, um, where we met the fixer. And we pulled into the, into the car park there. Um, my pal stayed with that, uh, put the keys uh, in, um, on the back wheel. And uh, he, he, he went across to a bench and just sat there looking at it. And, uh, and I went down to the, the little cafe there, and, uh, or little cafe restaurant. And when I got there, he said, you know what the f have you guys done? He said, uh, I've, I've been listening to it on the, on the news and on the, on the papers. He said, the Ocean's Eleven style heist. He said, what made you guys old Bill? I said it just seemed the, the, the most the easiest way of getting in there without causing any any dramas. And I said, have you have you have you sorted out our money? Because he transferred all our money into, into different accounts. And he said yes. Uh, we checked online uh, through for another pal of mine. Said everything's dropped. And I give I said like okay, the, the, the van's up the road with the keys are in a, on the back wheel. And he then sent his guy up there. He then took um, took the van away, and. Um, I just got up and walked away, and that was it, end of. And so once you'd successfully pulled off that job, were you afraid of being caught? No, no, no. You know, it's, you know I've been in this game for years, and I, you know, if you get away with 50 jobs and you get caught for one, <laughs> you know, that's going some. You know, most people don't get caught for, for the first jobs, you know, because this, this was, um, this involved some of the leading banks in, in, in America, JP Morgan and some leading banks. Um, we realised very, very quickly that um, the powers that be uh, were, were, were shutting, this, shutting this job down because uh, the next, that evening and the next day we had, we had in the evening stand was Ocean's Eleven style heist and men dressed as uh, um, 
as police officers with dogs and everything else, that was all there. And then the next day, there was nothing. You know, and then it, then it, then it became a burglary. And then, and, then, and then they put a statement out saying that, that in a very little, that we stole five million pounds of motherboards and Pentium chips, but no data. They said they, they forensically uh, checked everything, but nothing was taken. So we thought, brilliant. Uh, but, and then they said there was only three of us. And then all of a sudden it just went off, off the radar. But we didn't know, you know, t you know we didn't realise at the time that they put a 70 man squad on us. I, I can remember a, a couple of months later, I was, um, I was at my girlfriend's flat. And um, I, I normally get up at half four, five o'clock every morning. It's, it's just a habit of mine. And uh, I, I, I was ready. And uh, as I looked over, the, over the, the balcony, I saw a woman walk past and then a guy. And I thought, it just doesn't look right. You know, um, so I, you know, I just, I walked through, I picked up my rucksack, I had about 30 grand in it. Uh, I jumped up onto, onto, the, onto the roof and I ran along in you know, about three or 400 yards of where she lived in these flats. And, uh, and I went down a, a ladder and I, and I jumped about 10 or 15 foot. And, and as I came out, all I saw was, was all the old bill going in about 25 handed, all going into her flat, um, smashing in doors or whatever they'd done. All I see was going through the main door. I was, because she was up like two floors, three floors. Um, and that was it, and, I, and then after that I was on the run for a, for a year. I, I went and rented out a canal boat. And uh, in fact, I actually, for the first three months, I actually parked my canal boat behind Verizon, because it had a canal there. And I thought this would probably be the last place they're ever gonna look for me. So I stayed there for three months, and then I moved up to Northampton. And then I, and then I rented out a little cottage in uh, Lee Grave. Uh, and after about a year, because I, I was coming down to see my family and my kids and all that, and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get out of Dodge and I'm going to go over to Thailand. My mate had a little gaff out there. So I, I, I sorted out a passport, and um, that evening I, I'd arranged to go to, to, uh, to Thailand. I got the ticket bought for me and everything else. And uh, I can remember coming out of my little gaff and walking out the road uh, just to go, and get, get, go to the shop and get something to eat. And next thing, the whole street came alive with old Bill. And the next thing I knew, the, the calves came across the, the grass, heading towards me. As I looked around, one, one was heading behind me, then a van pulled up, and then the next thing I knew, I was on the floor. And, uh, and then it was over. You know, the, it was quite a relief, really. Unfortunately, um, MI5 or MI6, since they've, they've come back to England, they've, they've made a concerted effort towards criminals now to take us down and they got photo recognition everywhere now. And apparently I was seen in uh, West Hampstead on a, on a facial recognition, and they then mapped me back to, to Lee Grave, and that's where they, they plotted up the area. And when they saw me, they pounced on me, and they took the, the, the first opportunity to take me down, which is, which is what they do. And what were you sentenced with? I got sentenced to 17 years, um, which I thought was a little bit harsh at the time, because. Um, we never used any guns. I've done, I've done, uh, I've done, done eight years, four and a half months uh, of, of that sentence. Um, for me at this time, you know, I'd, I'd been in prison and been in care for most of my life as a young kid. And I'd done a four year sentence as a young man as well. And, and with that, they, 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 sent, they sent me, to, uh, they put me in the patches and they sent me to Pentonville. And, and when, I, when I was there, because I had a couple of busted ribs and a shoulder, uh, they, they sent a psychologist to see me, and um, and uh, up until that, that time, I'd never actually spoken about my life of being in care because I'd always normalised it. Um, and after uh, six or seven weeks of talking to uh, to the psych uh, forensic psychologist, um, I decided that uh, there was an experimental prison called uh, Grendon Underwood. Um, it was a therapeutic prison. It holds 228 men. It was, it was supposed to be the most dangerous in society. The serial killers, child killers, wife killers, uh, paedophiles, rapists, everything now. And these are, the, these are the people I was with. They killed kids. They killed families and that. But I learned a lot, of, a lot about tolerance then, a lot about understanding, a lot about shame, about guilt, about embarrassment. And over that two and a half period, uh, two and a half year period, I, I, I sort of really got in touch with who I was. Um, it made me see that, that going to care really was uh, was something that I really normalised, but it wasn't normal. I think as a 10 or 11 year old kid, uh, 
being beaten by, by grown men. Um, wasn't really conducive to turning me into a productive member of society. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to blame me being beaten. I'm not going to blame me being in care. I'm not going to blame social or economic uh, factors in my life because the decisions that I made were, were mine. You know, there were lots of kids that I met in care that had been beaten the same way, and then went on to lead productive lives. Um, I'd be stupid to say that, that I don't regret it. Um, I think it made me who I am. Unfortunately, I still get looked at from now, from time to time, because um, no mother balls were ever recovered, um, no money was ever recovered, and only two of us have ever been nicked um, out of the ten of us. So, so I know that no one grasps us up, and there was no one in our, in our, in our firm that would uh, have done that. Otherwise, we'd have all been nicked. And I'm not going to defend what I did. You know, there's always victims in this. I'm not going to say that the, 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 the banks steal millions of, of people and that justifies me doing it. It was just a job and my job was crime. I had to strip down to next to nothing and grease out, put a towel over the cut section of bar off the window so it wouldn't scratch my back and levered myself out while Sten wrenched that up just another little inch, probably strangling everybody he'd always hated since childhood but just enough for me to get out.